トビデオ The first half of the 90s are a very strange and exciting time for anime. It's a period in anime history where the entire industry is going through a big, long, slow transition. The extravagant 80s had come to an end, and now the recession fueled hangover of the 90s loomed in the distance. This didn't mean big budget productions went away, though. The OVA market was still going strong, and American production companies were still farming out their animation to Japanese studios, which is how they made their bread back then. But the Japanese economy tanking did put the studios on notice that they should be a little more sagacious on choosing which projects get the money and the time. This, however, did not stop more experimental projects. On the contrary, the anime that was being greenlit in this period got way out there. Sometimes in an auteur driven sense, but mostly in a we're throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks sense. Lots of tropes and franchises that were established and perfected in the late 70s to early 80s were now growing long in the tooth, and now was the time for some fresh ideas. And while this was the time of classic manga adaptations like Rama 1 Half, Dragon Ball Z, and Sailor Moon, this was also a time for brand new, never before seen anime to emerge like Nadia The Secret of Blue Water and Irresponsible Captain Tyler. Even older franchises saw this as a time to completely reinvent themselves as seen with Macross, Dirty Pair, and Gundam. It was a wild time, but eventually it slowed down around the mid 90s when anime like Slayers and Evangelion became such monster hits that it pretty much recalibrated the industry into the direction it wanted to go in. Still, a lot of the zanier anime of the 90s did originate in the former half of it. Not all, but most. And today's subject is a perfectly cromulent example of such. <laughs> It's 10,000 years into the future and the Earth has been split horizontally in half. In the southern hemisphere, that's currently floating in a different dimension, lives the humans, an arrogant race who flaunt their idea of supremacy through their advanced technology. In the northern hemisphere, full of lush greenery, lives the beasts, a seemingly human-like race who actually have the ability to turn into anthropomorphic animals. They all live in tribes centered around their species. An evil organization of humans named Uranus, led by the evil overlord of the same name, kidnaps and takes prisoner three young royals from three tribes. Wanderbard, the hot-blooded and gluttonous prince of the Tiger tribe, The next time I see them I'll kick their butts and mop the floor with them! Arrgh! Bud Mint, the hapless, lecherous prince of the Bird tribe, I am known as the Sorrowful Coat. Hey, it's impolite to ignore people! And Maymar, the impatient and greedy princess of the Mermaid Tribe. I don't think I can eat another bite! Ha! No wonder the way you were chowing down! <laughs> oh, and there's also Maymar's companion, Tuttle, who got dragged along with them. Oh, one! Ah! <laughs> Tuttle, you too? Anyways, the four companions are able to escape thanks to the mysterious help of a human scientist named Professor Password and his young granddaughter, Uni. But before they can escape, Password ends up biting the big one, but not before telling our heroes to take Uni in exchange for seeking out the mysterious treasure of Gaia. Please take care of Uni. She is the key to everything. You must take Uni to Gaia. <sighs> So with the mission given, our four heroes set off with Uni in tow to seek the treasure of Gaia. But it turns out Uranus is also seeking the treasure, and to stop our protagonist, they send out their elite yet hilariously inept henchmen, Vidarn, Vision, and their sadistic demon imp companion, Akumako. Uh, uh. K I L L, what do you want? Ah! Those wretched beasts! I'll get them! I'll kill them all! The mission begin! But even if those three were good at their jobs, Juan, Maymar, and Bud have with them three mighty mechs called Jins, each representing their tribe. But as they venture further on their journey, our heroes soon find out that it is Uni who is the key to unlocking the true power of the Jins, and maybe even Gaia. KO Beast, or as it's known by its full title, KO Century Beast Warriors, is an OVA that originally began as a three episode series released in 1992, but was popular enough to warrant a four episode sequel that wrapped up the story in 1993. 
KO Beast exists in my mind as one of the incredibly early 90s looking anime that only seemed to exist in singular two episode volumes that collected dust on the shelf at the local FYE. But when I actually sat down and watched this anime, I came away with some pretty interesting observations. Despite only being seven episodes, a whole lot of stuff happens in those seven episodes. Here comes the ultimate solar powered special attack, courtesy of Batman's Hero of the Bird Clan, Sandbeam! Huh, that's weird. And we're here to talk about them. We're going to break down KO Beast and see if it's on top of the food chain or extinct on arrival. Ron, did you say something? I didn't say anything. Let's start by answering the most relevant question first. What exactly is up with this anime's art style? KO Beast's art style is indicative of the type of art style that defined most 90s anime. Big eyes, highly angular hairstyles, cartoonish proportions, etc. No one, not even the actual human beings in the story, looks like a human being. The reason for this is because KO Beast was an anime conceived by the same group of creators that pioneered this very art style. In 1990, there was a TV anime release called NG Night Ramune in 40. It was a fantasy slash mecha slash comedy anime that was defined mostly by its very cartoony character designs. And most of the staffers who defined Ramune's look and feel would go on to form a small collective called Zero G Room. One of the projects Zero G Room would begin to work on after Ramune wrapped was KO Beast. And there are so much similarities between the two of them stylistically that some anime fans have even called KO Beast a spiritual spinoff to Ramune. A theory that's given more credence when you look at Zero G's codename that they were credited under. In Ramune, they went by B3, while in KO Beast, they were credited under the name Project B4. Of the Zero G staffers, there are four members that can be given the most responsibility in shaping KO Beast. First, there's director Hiroshi Nageshi. He was the original director for Ramune as well as the founder of Zero G. He has a very varied resume as a director with titles that range from Tekaman Blade, Tenchi Universe, and Amazing Nurse Nanako. <laughs> Screenwriter Satoru Akahori, who we talked about in our Sorcerer Hunters video as someone whose bread and butter is high concept fantasy and sci-fi stories with screwball edges to them. Mecha designer Rei Nakahara, an esteemed giant robot designer and animator who collaborated with Nageshi on Tekaman Blade and its sequel. And finally, original creator and character designer Takehiko Ito. He created the original concept for KO Beast as well as Ramune. But his most famous work was a little title that outshone both of them in Legacy named Outlaw Star. And honestly, considering the comedy in that anime, I'm not that shocked. You are an immortal Kataro Kataro. So yeah, these four are the people who helped make KO Beast come together through style and story. How exactly did they do? Well, see for yourself. I can see why this design fell out of fashion after a certain point in the late 90s. It's almost too stereotypically anime to really take seriously. But man, you cannot deny that it has certain advantages. The character animation of KO Beast is top shelf, a compliment that I can credit to the designs of the characters being so versatile in their simplicity. The bodies of nearly all the characters have a very classic cartoony feel with their torsos usually being simple shapes with skinny limbs that end with exaggerated hands and feet. It's a school of design that just excels in great comedic slapstick, practically anime Looney Tunes. Golden Sea Beam Twin Bladed Moon Crusher! It doesn't stop at the comedy though. All the animation is just really good. They take a few cheats here and there, but for the most part, it feels like the animators don't want to skimp on anything, whether they be a huge mech battle, or Juan and Bud having a Castle of Cagliostro fight over spaghetti. <laughs> but 
But how, pray tell, can such a small studio manage to put out such a consistent rate of good to great animation for the series? Well, the secret is that Zero-G had some help. Not just from Animate Studios, where they got most of their resources from, but from a studio of more esteemed note. It's hard to really tell which animators from Gainax worked on which episodes and scenes, but they clearly did enough that multiple sources claimed them as co-producers alongside Zero-G. If I had an educated guess as to where they did the most work, it would have to be episode 4 because the animation there is buck wild. The voice acting in this anime is done well in both the original Japanese and the English versions. In Japanese, you have stalwart talent Kabe Yamaguchi voicing Wan. He gives them your typical shonen hot-bloodedness, but with a vulnerable edge to him to make him sound like the perfect lovable idiot. Wan! You have a hagari kibagaru! Nebo kibop! Plus, he makes Wan sound like a kitty cat so well. <laughs> And Yasunori Matsumoto does a great job as V-Darn, giving him a determined, arrogant baritone that clashes well with his hapless buffoonery. But before I talk about the English dub, which, spoiler alert, I find myself preferring, I do need to mention that there was another English dub that was released in the UK back in the 90s. It's one defined by some heavy British accents, and it was only produced for the first three episodes, but it seems like quite a few people online have a fondness for this dub. Also, Helen McCarthy is in this dub as Akumako. Yeah, that Helen McCarthy. This particular dub hasn't been officially released in any capacity since 1994, and considering that K.O. Beast is currently out of print at the time of this recording, it's doubly out of print. But you can watch the whole dub on archive.org, and honestly, I don't see the appeal. What? Hey, did anyone hear that? Uh, uh. That's funny. It's kind of dull and flat, and the Cockney accents are the only thing that it has going for it. But then again, this could be my own bias showing because... I'm an American citizen, buddy! Back to the more complete dub, I like this one more because it was a product of that golden period of New York dubbing. This is a cast full of big names, or about to be big names. Juan is played excellently by then-newcomer Sam Regal, playing him as the hyperactive, lovable goof that he is. My whole body hurts. Please don't be mad at us, bud! Oh. Deborah Rabbi plays May Marwell as a sweet princess who also can't sanction her companion's constant jackassery. Bud, meanwhile, is played by future voice acting legend Liam O'Brien, who, despite initially sounding all over the place, does sell Bud as this completely frantic loser who fancies himself suaver than he actually is. Ah, triple run! Oh my god, it's unbelievable! <laughs> this game is fixed! It's some horrible plot to do me in! The three villains of KO Beast have often been compared to another famous trio of fail prone anime villains. Team Rocket, blast off at the speed of light! Surrender now, or prepare to fight! Yeah, that's right! And the comparison becomes easier to draw once you realize that the voice of Jesse, Rachel Lillis, is the one who's playing VC on. She could have easily used her Jesse voice for this role, but she smartly opts for something different that fits VC on's character. She instead sounds like, what if Jesse was a mall goth who was 100% done with all of this shit. Morning, six. Shut up! I just can't stand the movement of the ocean! Mm, what a lovely sound! Would you like me to rub your back? That happens to be my chest! But my favorite role is Akamako, who is being played by a thoroughly unhinged Lisa Ortiz. She is just going hog wild in the recording booth playing this demented little gremlin. Imagine all those lines coming out of Amy Rose. Yay! A massacre! Everyone's gonna die! I 
wonder if I can eat them all. The dub also benefits from the localizer, who was also Rachel Lillis, adapting some of the more Japanese jokes into jokes Western audiences can better understand and laugh at. I'm like a bird, I only fly away. Uh <laughs> But it doesn't overplay its hand and bog the anime down with these references to then current popular culture. Although Rachel was acutely aware that she and other Pokemon voice actors were on this dub and was not immune to such temptation. This is slightly different from before. Last time I could move my wings at least. I feel like I'm in a Pokeball. Regardless, it's localization decisions that work for this type of anime. KOB's soul is that of a screwball comedy. Everything is wild, hammy, and doesn't take itself too seriously. The engine that moves this madcap menagerie along the track is the characters. They are all naturally funny characters in their own special way, and that leaves some easy setups for some great jokey set pieces. Juan is a hyperactive glutton, Maymar is an exasperated princess, and Bud is an arrogant lech who bears the brunt of most of the physical comedy in the series. <laughs> Uni, stop! Come on, you're gonna make me molt right in front of the women! Oh, come on! But our hero's status as comedic characters also comes in the form of their main motivation. While they do end up doing the right thing, their goal to reach the treasure of Gaia has nothing to do with saving the world. They just want the treasure itself, even if they don't know what exactly it is. Juan thinks it's food, Bud thinks it's girls, and Maymar thinks it's gold. Sure. Would this treasure happen to be in the form of dinner? Is it pretty? Aren't there lots of lovely girls? Uh, perhaps. I mean, it sort of depends. You know? Wow! What drives our heroes to go on this quest is pure selfishness. And it was probably the only reason they would accept the quest in the first place. But those three jinns are not just weapons. They serve a far <laughs> greater purpose than that. You see, they... Ah! The only one who is taking this quest the least bit seriously is Tuttle, who is mostly here to act as the guardian and protector for Uni. But even then, he's not immune to these sorts of shenanigans. In fact, sometimes they use his only sane man status to its advantage. One of the best comedic moments is in the beginning of episode 4. Our four heroes have been stuck in a cave for 5 days and are playing a high stakes game of Mahjong to figure out who gets to eat who. Bud loses obviously, and when Wan and Maymar attack him, he tries to get Tuttle to calm them down, but only gets this answer. Tuttle! Raw meat isn't good for you. You should cook it first. <laughs> Tuttle! And it goes without saying that our little team Rocket Trio are another source of the anime's laughs. Vidarn's egotism and prejudice against the beast makes it so delicious when he's constantly put in humiliating situation after humiliating situation. It's always pleasant to see all of his bravado evaporate once the beasts have him dead to rights. <laughs> Wait, let's talk about this! You wouldn't harm an unarmed man now, would you? <laughs> oh no, and who was attacking us just now when we were unarmed? Vision, by comparison, doesn't have that much funny moments since she kind of has to play straight man to Vidarn's clownery. But on the rare chance she does get the joke played on her, it's pretty funny. Like how she spends an entire episode and a half incapacitated with seasickness. So what? I have told you that we cannot deal with the beasts until the battleship has been fixed! Oh. I'm not well. And Akumako could have easily been a huge annoyance for her shtick just being screaming at Vidarns and Visan to KILL IT! KILL THEM! KILL THEM! Just so she can feast on the deceased souls. Dig in time! Come on! Oh. Stand up for your soul! I know it's in there somewhere! Yeah. Ooh, he's a tough one! But it works for me. Partially because of Lisa Ortiz's and Naoko Matsui's performance, but also because she is responsible for one of my biggest laughs in the series where our heroes and antagonists are gathered in one place near the end and Akumako decides to hijack Vidarn's mecha so she can kill everyone and eat their souls, including her master. But what empowers the humor of K.O. Beast is that the anime does not appear to be interested in keeping things dramatic for very long. Any moment that the anime could lapse into such seriousness, there's always a joke ready in the wings to undercut the drama. Eat 
Each one of those bubbles is counting down the last moments of my life, and by the time they are gone, I will be in heaven. Kyo Beast really put a lot of thought and effort into making this anime fun and funny as a screwball comedy. It's a pity the same can't be said for the plots. I was bowled over when I found out that the same guy who did Outlaw Star conceived Kyo Beast because unlike Outlaw Star which feels very tight and has a lot of thought put into its world building so any weirdness feels natural, Kyo Beast feels very sloppy by comparison. Which you could chalk up to Ito still learning the more intricate rules of plotting, or Akahori choosing to be more focused on the humor of the anime, but it doesn't make the plotting any less careless. For one thing, the world building feels half-baked. The entire setting hinges on the conflict between humans and the race of beasts. And I don't know if this is the possum in me talking, but I feel like that the whole dichotomy between the two races would land better if the beast characters didn't stay in their human forms for 75% of the anime. You can give Maymar a pass because you really can't walk that far on fins, but what's really stopping the anime from one being a tiger boy all the time? At the very least, it would solve the problem of him having two sets of ears in his beast form. Speaking of beast forms, it's established early that in order for our characters to change into those forms, they need outside stimuli. Juan can only change into a tiger if he sneezes. Maymar can only change into a mermaid if she cries or gets wet. And Bud can only change into a bird if he gets goosebumps. This rule is pretty consistent for the first couple of episodes as it allows for moments of jokey suspense. Hurry up and do it if you don't want to die! <laughs> Not that, you idiot! What? I meant lick my face! Uh... Just do it already! <laughs> But as the anime continues, it seems like that rule gets forgotten and our heroes can transform them to their beast forms at will, usually when it's very convenient for the plot. Like I'm pretty sure Juan stops sneezing after a certain point. And plot convenience is the name of the game. KO Beast is unafraid to pull a lot of story elements that would have served the narrative better if they were established earlier, but they only get introduced if the plot needs it at the moment. Maymar being a sword fighter probably would have helped out a lot if it had been brought up in episode 1 and not at the tail end of episode 5. But the big plot problems are all stuffed in at the very end. So remember how I said that K.O. Beast's strength as a series is that it focuses on comedy and doesn't take itself too seriously? Yeah, after a certain point, they stopped doing that. In researching K.O. Beast, a common criticism I found was that the final episode is universally considered to be the worst episode of the series. That notion is, unfortunately, right on the money. But before we even get into all the juicy details, I should mention that there is actually some build up to all the badness. So at the end of episode 4, Uranus, finally fed up with Vidarn and Viseon's failures, decides to send in the big guns after our heroes, a mysterious masked warrior by the name of SB Icecow. There's really not a lot of jokes with this character, other than the fact that they seem to be accompanied by a group of masked cheerleading Sentai girls whose skin tight outfits look like they were designed specifically to give me Agent Ica flashbacks. Circus Axe. Stay out of this! So Ice Gale kidnaps Uni, but not before engaging in a hard fought battle with our heroes. And once Juan gets a good hit in, it knocks off Ice Gale's mask to reveal that they are actually a wo 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 woman. I can't believe it's a woman. Oh, how beautiful! <laughs> By the way, Ice Gal in the dub is voiced by Jessica Calvello in a surprisingly sedate role compared to what she was doing around the time, at least by her standards. You want to be locked up in a zoo! So Ice Gal ends up retreating, and after some light comedy, our hero suddenly realize, hey wait a minute, where's Uni? Yeah, they were so preoccupied with fighting Ice Gal that they just completely forgot that her goons made off with Uni to open the treasure of Gaia. Luckily, our heroes still have Uni's crystal ball, which has been their GPS all this time, to track Uni's location to the North Pole. So they end up at the location, which is this solar punk sanctum hidden within a giant iceberg, and they end up confronting Ice Gal and her goons, along with our friends Team Sprocket here. And there's this good joke of the anime having this moment of self-awareness and acknowledging that Vidarn and Viseon have been made completely redundant by Ice Gal's presence. <coughs> hey! SP Ice Gal! Give Uni back! But we have no need for Vidarn and Vijan. They could probably just leave. Huh? What did you say? 
So we get this huge fight where the anime's strongest physical comedy is on display, and it all ends with the Mexican standoff that gets broken up by Akumako crashing the party as I explained a few paragraphs ago. And if you liked what you saw with that set piece, cherish it. It's the last bit of effective comedy we have in this anime because, from this point onward, things get really stupid. So we get a flashback to Ice Gal's childhood and we see that, huh, apparently Ice Gal's grandfather was Professor Password. Hmm. We also see that she had a pet cat, pet bird, pet fish, and pet turtle as a kid, and before you say anything else, no, that doesn't lead to anywhere in the plot, so it might as well just be a red herring. Our heroes chase after Ice Gal until they end up in the core of Gaia. They are finally ready to fight Ice Gal, but Uni jumps in front of them and refuses to let them harm her. This causes Ice Gal to get her memories back since we learned that she was actually brainwashed by Uranus and that Ice Gal isn't actually her real name. My, my name is... Uni Charm P Password. Huh? But while our heroes are grappling with that plot revelation, Uranus swoops down and takes control of Gaia. This is because Uranus is actually a supercomputer and needs to take control of Gaia, also a supercomputer, to reunite the two halves of the world so that he may reign over it as its resident Skynet. But he's unable to take control of the entire network because the uni that's been traveling with our entire party turns out to be essentially Gaia's antivirus software in the form of a young version of the real uni. And we're still not even at the bad final episode yet. One thing you notice with the final episode is that the animation has taken a real hit. It's flatter, stiffer, and reliant, and a whole lot more cheats. It's a good thing our villain for half this episode is a crystal polygon who can just float across the screen like that. It also feels like the content rating has inexplicably gone up for this episode. Not only is there visible blood all of a sudden, but one of the first things we see is the camera hanging on Uni's naked breast for quite a while. But those are all things I can handle, or at the very least, tolerate. What I can't tolerate is Uni deciding to give everyone else a huge exposition dump of how the world of humanity and beasts came this way because of Uranus and Gaia. The answer Uranus gave was the ultimate progression through mechanization. The answer Gaia gave was spiritual stabilization through harmony with nature. Now the anime has gone from being a screwball comedy to a meditation on nature versus technology, and boy does it feel like the anime is punching above its weight class with these heavy themes it's bringing up. The two computers were originally set up by the human ancestors to search for a better life, but in their quest, they made a very grave mistake. I'd like to remind everyone that this is how the last episode began. <laughs> So then we move on to a final mech fight between our heroes and Uranus, who's looking like a genocyber reject here. It's thoroughly unremarkable animation-wise, and a lot of it is mostly focused on our heroes in the cockpit talking with Gaia. Meanwhile, Uni, wounded from an attack by Uranus, ends up dying in Tuttle's arms, and re remember when this was a comedy anime? <laughs> Okay, skip to the end, our heroes defeat Uranus thanks to Gaia pulling a literal deus ex machina, emphasis on the machina. After that, we cut to a nondescript time skip where we see that Juan and Maymar are implied to be a couple now, despite there being no romantic interest between either parties. Heteronormity. And then... What is it? We're saying goodbye to Uni today. Oh, that's right. Wait. Sheesh, you're always like this. Hurry up! <laughs> oh, give me a break. Wait a minute. Hurry up! One! Sorry about that! I kind of overslept. <laughs> How typical of one. No kidding. I bet he would have slept until nightfall if I hadn't woken him. She's dead. We saw her die. We saw her say her last words and breathe her last breath. That whole sequence was framed like a death scene. Why is Uni still alive? One. Bud. Maymare, Tuttle, thank you all, and I bid you goodbye now. Oh, we're not going to get an explanation? Not even a hint? We're just going to let this rock? 
okay, fine, whatever. Anime's over anyway. No doubt about it, this is a crummy last episode. It feels like an entirely different anime than the one we had spent three hours watching. Just stripping all of the anime's strengths and unique qualifiers away to formulate something so incredibly ill-conceived and standard. Because of this not great ending, it really kind of makes KO Beast hard to recommend. It's not like I didn't have fun with the parts of the anime that didn't suck, but that ending really leaves a sour taste in your mouth. I guess if you do know that the ending is coming, the blow does get softened, but maybe you're just better off watching six of the seven episodes and just assuming that everything ends up working out in the end. As for the rest of the anime, it's still pretty good though. Just the nice, cartoony antics of Beast Folk on their wacky little side quests. Sometimes all you need are just good hearty laughs to soothe the savage beast within. Let's go! <laughs>